Welcome to Learning Uncut, where we talk about real learning solutions with people who made them work. Here are your hosts, Michelle Ockers and Karen Maloney. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Learning Uncut. I'm Karen Maloney. And I'm Michelle Ockers. And today we're talking to Rob Wilkins, who is the leader of information management with the New South Wales Department of Education. Hi, Rob. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Karen. How are you going? And thank you for having me. You're very welcome, Rob. Today we're talking about a topic which introduces a different way of looking at creating learning and could probably make some of our audience a bit nervous, and that's distributed authorship. Michelle, would you like to kick this one off? I would love to. Um, Rob, the term distributed authorship uh, is something which will be new to a lot of our listeners. Can you give us um, a brief definition of the term and a high-level description of what it looks like so we can get our heads around it? Yeah, for sure. Um, Look, distributed authorship, or what I loosely term let go and let learn, is all about um, instead of having two or three people within the organisation who are responsible for doing that, let's make sure that we've got 10,000 in my case. Uh, People out there who have got a role on the learning management system that allows them to create learning from scratch, design the way that they will actually deliver their face-to-face education, their virtual classrooms, their e-learning, and let them describe um, what the purpose of the learning is, why it's being rolled out, what it's being done for, what the expected objectives and outcomes are going to be, and how people can actually enrol on that learning and participate on that, where the venues might be, and what people might expect from the training. That in itself is, uh, in a nutshell, what distributed authorship re- represents, is being able to actually hand over full control of your learning management system for the creation of, um, curation of, and distribution of learning. It's kind of radically different from what many people listening will be used to. Um, when was it introduced into the Department of Education and why did this sort of let, letting go of control and handing over full control of you know, course development, management, delivery, when did that happen and why? It was pri- primarily used for teacher education and it was primarily used in a way that their old learning management system was, for want of a better term, a glorified scheduling system where they would be able to actually put up and advertise sessions that were being run where teachers could come along and learn from other teachers. Um, When I was brought into the organisation, one of the things that they were doing was realising that that system couldn't cater for all different modes of delivery and the need to have um, online learning and virtual classrooms and and start to take effective learning technology that they already had for students but weren't necessarily using for their own professional development um, rose to the top. And what we did with it was basically say, firstly, ask the question, so why do people want to actually learn from other teachers? And fundamentally, it was a very, very simple answer. My preference to learn from a peer who is having major success in the way that they're applying pedagogical practice, in the way that they're structuring learning classrooms, learning environments, school classrooms and other things. My preference is to learn from people who are doing and having success rather than learning from anybody who's got a nice theoretical basis or anything else uh, that they'd actually like to apply to that. And it became a really, really important aspect for us in terms of recognising that fundamentally what existed through, I think, evolution was a peer education model within the organisation and that was highly respected and highly regarded. And when something, I think, has grown organically and grown naturally within an organisation, what you really want to do is not break that, not break the mould at all, but augment that in some way, shape or manner. And we used to have um, a lot of people who were given the ability to be able to schedule those classroom events, if you like. All we did was augment that and take that to another level and say to principals and head teachers and deputies, who would you like to have access to this system? Um, how much access would you like them to actually have? We'll, and we do have some limitations in terms of what we give them, but primarily they've got the ability to be able to actually author any type of mode of delivery that they like um, to to offer this learning either within the school, within the district, or across the state if they feel that there's actually something worthwhile. Okay, so, and it's, um, just to be clear, because of course in the education department there's a lot of students out there as well, this is very much about peer-to-peer learning, so teacher-to-teacher learning? 
very much. This is about teacher professional development, principal yep. professional development, and corporate professional development, I might add, too. Um, there's nothing that actually doesn't stop um, any of our corporate colleagues running a program, you know, from a management development sense or even a personal development sense and offering that to the wider corporate sphere also. Just um, digging into some of the how-tos around that. So um, if you look at the process for creating a course under that distributed authorship model, can you just walk us through an interim process that a teacher would follow from sort of having an idea for a you know, piece of learning to actually getting it out there? 